Hello, everyone. I'm Leslie Looney, the current chair and professor of astronomy here at the uh, University of Illinois. It's a great pleasure to welcome everyone to the 2021 Eco Eben Junior Colloquium in Astronomy, part of the 2021 Eco Eben Lecture, which will have a public talk component tomorrow. The Eco Eben Lecture Series was founded 24 years ago, thanks to the generosity of our own Eco Eben Junior, a distinguished professor of emeritus of astronomy and physics. This year, it's even more exciting because it's our 100th year anniversary. Eco science has made an indelible mark on astrophysics and on this campus. He's been a pioneer in the study of stellar evolution, particularly late phases of stellar life. Eco's rigorous combination of analytical and numerical methods set the tone and approach that is the hallmark of Illinois astrophysics today. He served as department head and built the modern astronomy department. Eco devoted his career to making Illinois a center for forefront astrophysics and even lecturers celebrate scientists who embody the spirit of excellence. Eco couldn't be here today, but I'm sure he's pleased with our outstanding speaker. In honor of our 100th anniversary, our, we have a distinguished University of Illinois PhD alum, Professor Vicki Caligara. Vicki is the co-founder and the current director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Exploration and Research in Astrophysics, and the Daniel I. Linzer Distinguished University Professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy in the Library College of Arts and Sciences at Northwestern University. Vicki is a leading astrophysicist in the LIGO scientific collaboration, LIGO being the telescopes that first detected gravitational waves in 2015. Vicki is an expert in astrophysics of black holes and neutron stars, and in astrophysics of black holes, oh sorry, neutron stars, and in gravitational wave data analysis. She also studies the formation and evolution of stars and the remnants detectable as gamma ray, X ray, and radio pulsar sources in the electromagnetic spectrum over a wide range of stellar environments. Her research involves methods with applied mathematics, statistics, and computer science, with extensive use of high-performance computing. For her research, she has been recognized by numerous awards, including being named a 2021 Guggenheim Fellow, being elected to the US National Academy of Sciences in 2018, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2021. She served the professional community in many roles, including co-chair of the Committee on Astro Astronomy and Astrophysics of the National Academy of Sciences, so let's welcome Vicky for a talk titled Gravitational Waves, Astrophysics, Progress, and Puzzles. Okay, thank you, Leslie, for this introduction. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. And I hope people on Zoom can hear me as well. I want to first thank the people in the audience uh, who came in person. Uh, you're braver than I am. If I were you, I would stay on Zoom. Uh, and of course, thanks to the whoever is on Zoom, and I don't know where to look uh, for you to see my uh, straight in my eyes, but that's not going to happen, as it hasn't happened for a year and a half. Um, it's a great pleasure to be uh, back on campus for these uh, couple of days. Um, thank you <laughs> uh, for these couple of days uh, to spend time again here. Uh, of course, I was here as a graduate student. And I always welcome the opportunity to be back. Um, I will, uh, I, I want, before I get started, uh, I want to, I, I could thank many, many people. Uh, some are present, some are not present from my, the, my time as a graduate student. But I do want to get started by thanking Ron Webbing, my PhD advisor. Without him, I wouldn't be uh, where I am today. He taught me a lot of things, both in science, but in the way of doing science. And I value that even more. Um, in many ways, also, he got me started uh, or got me intrigued in gravitational waves because he always had a side project, uh, a secret side project that I knew was related to gravitational waves, but he wouldn't talk about it. Um, and uh, also, it, it's a special honor to be here this time as the Eco Iben uh, lecturer. Of course, I took his stellar structure and evolution uh, courses with him. And in his special way, he made sure I uh, fully understood and could uh, fully justify everything in my PhD. And of all the people in here, Ron knows what I'm talking about. Um, OK, so let's get started. So uh, it's been now uh, six years since our first discovery. And what I'll try to do in the time Leslie will allow me uh, we have negotiated, um, is to give you a 
a, a summary, uh, an overall view of the current status of where we are with gravitational wave astrophysics. In terms of our discoveries, I'm a member of the LIGO scientific collaboration. Uh, so when I talk about the discoveries, I represent the whole LIGO science collaboration, but also the Virgo collaboration. Uh, but also I will jump into, uh, whenever I can, into I'll select a few topics to tell you more about what the discoveries are telling us, uh, what we think we have learned so far, and what uh, definitely we don't understand at this point. Um, so let's get started. So here's the, first of all, the collection of all the institutions in the current LIGO science collaboration. I've been a member of this uh, collaboration for over 20 years now. Um, and I'm glad I made that decision, even though at the time it wasn't at all fashionable. Um, over the years, I, when I first started, I worked on uh, pure astrophysics, doing source modeling and predictions. Uh, hoping one day to do interpretation of uh, uh, observations, uh, but um, very quickly, well, very quickly in comparison over 20 years, I moved into data analysis. And that's when I, uh, I ended up becoming a theorist observer at the time. And in my group, we developed um, the first methods for parameter estimation, which is basically extracting the sources, the, the uh, source properties from the gravitational wave signal. Uh, and now I work on analyzing population properties and model selections. Now I say I, and of course you know very well, it's not I at all anymore. Uh, it's really with uh, group members, some have left and moved on and some are current. Um, and without them, I wouldn't be doing any of this. Uh, along the way, I got uh, interested even in detector, uh, detectors and noise characterization and have had the great pleasure of working on a citizen science project with computer scientists and human computer interaction uh, um, experts. And that has been a lot of fun as well. Uh, so I bring you this up because please do Google Gravity Spy and join the tens of thousands of citizen scientists to help us out. What keeps me busy now, actually, now that the detectors are down, is developing uh, this thing called Poseidon. I won't go through everything on this slide, only to say that it is a very big collaboration that I'm happy to co-lead with my ex-PhD student, uh, Tassos Fragos. And what we're trying to do is actually develop the first general purpose population synthesis code for binary evolution that uses um, real, uh, real, a, a full stellar structure and evolution codes for the treatment of binary evolution instead of what we've been using for 20 years now with rapid population synthesis. Okay, so with, um, with uh, all of these interests, of course, what has been driving all of these interests have been the, um, uh, the amazing evolution and advancement in detector technology, very first with LIGO, uh, when we started uh, our first observing run, uh, we were very happy to receive our first uh, detection right as soon as we started. It was, this is advanced LIGO, of course. We spent another 12 years uh, just uh, receiving noise and calculating upper limits. So, you know, we had a strong character by that time. Um, so uh, right now, where are we? We have completed what we call observing run three. Uh, and we have basically, uh, we, the, our instrumentation colleagues have reached the targeted design sensitivity. Uh, and this is what we owe all these discoveries to and some data analysis. Um, our goal is to uh, launch observing run four sometime in the summer 2022. Uh, and this is uh, the detectors are being worked on right now so that we can achieve this sensitivity. The numbers you see here are how far away on average, depending on sky location and orientation, can we see a double neutron star uh, when we observe with a certain sensitivity of the instrument, okay? So this is what we're expecting. And this is what happened in terms of the number of detections and candidates I show you here, because we have not announced our detections from the second part of the third observing run. 
So, uh, so I'm, I'm cumulative number of gravitational wave triggers up until O3A, we have the detections, and then we have a lot more triggers. Some of them are real detections, some of them are not. Stay tuned, this should be coming uh, later in the fall. And you can see the, um, the big boost we had at the end of O2 when our uh, uh, detection uh, capability and sensitivity curve broadened, opened up, and we got a broader, both lower sensitivity, but also broader in uh, frequency range. All right, so when we started, or at least before the detections, if you looked, if you made this plot, back then we didn't make this plot, uh, and you put all the known neutron stars with uh, mass measurements and the known black hole mass measurements, and I apologize because here now I have the non-scientific plot, error bars are missing, we have two versions, one without error bars and one with error bars. Um, so uh, we, this is what we knew, okay? These are black hole measurements, of course, some with very large error bars at the time, and these were neutron stars, and again, some with very large error bars. I think I can use this. With our um, first uh, couple of observing runs, we added to this with binary black holes, uh, and this is where we are now at the end of O3A, uh, so in about five years. And from O3B, we have announced two special sources that sort of close the trifecta, I say. Um, we have uh, announced that we have detected now neutron star black holes coming together to form another black hole. And we have two of these sources. One is strongly reliable. The other is not uh, uh, very strongly of astrophysical nature, but it is reported as well. And that's our, the latest news from the collaboration. <clears throat> okay. When it comes to astrophysics, what is it that we tend to be in interested in? Well, first we start with what we measure. Okay, so we measure masses. That's our number one. Uh, target. So we are interested in how massive the black holes and neutron stars are. Then for black holes, we can actually, uh, for usually the most massive of the two black holes, we sometimes can put constraints on how fast the black hole is spinning. And sometimes, even fewer times, we can uh, figure out how the spin axis is oriented with respect to the orbital angular momentum, at least. Um, at different frequencies inside the LIGO band, LIGO band bands. We are asking questions about how are the mergers distributed in, on the sky and along distance. And of course, we have a number of outlier events in many different ways that look very bizarre or interesting or unusual, and we study those especially. And then, uh, of course, we measure the rates. And if you know a little bit about what I was doing 15 years ago, that's how I started, by making rate predictions, which I stopped doing since about 2010 because I got sick and tired of that. Um, but now the rates are becoming interesting again because we have many events, you'll see in a minute. Ultimately, we want to answer this question. How are these gravitational wave sources, whether are pure black holes or black holes and neutron stars, are actually forming in the universe? And certainly we don't have an answer right now. Uh, there are two ways, big picture ways to form them. <clears throat> and I'm focusing here on binary black hole, black holes, because you know uh, that's where the sample is dominated by. Um, we can form them in principle. Uh, we can form them through isolated binaries, through some you know, variations, uh, there are differences on what properties you're gonna get depending on what happens in isolated binary evolution. Or you can form black holes in dense stellar environments. You form the black holes separately and then through dynamical interactions, which could be in global clusters, in young clusters, in galactic centers, or even early in the universe, primordial black holes, you end up creating pairs and eventually they merge. <clears throat> So as I said, I'm gonna start from summarizing what is going on with the rates right now. And I'm gonna start by pointing out the following. Before we pay attention to numbers, I'd like to point out the following. Um, when we, we, we had the first 
binary black hole back in 2015, we reported a rate with one source. Okay, people laughed, but hey, I was doing rates when we had two double neutron stars, so don't laugh. Um, uh, and the reason we could report a rate is because the selection effects in LIGO are very well understood. It's a very highly controlled experiment. Um, and uh, we could characterize the noise, we could do uh, simulations, and we could actually uh, do statistics, not decent, but statistics with one event. And this was the broad uncertainty factor with one event. What I want to point out is that as we kept increasing the number of detections up to 10, okay, not now where we are close to 50, the uncertainty factor on the rate went down, but the range, the final range at 10, never shifted away from this initial range. This is not an accident, actually. I can spend more time explaining this. Um, but, um, but I point this out because I'm gonna tell you rates about neutron star black holes and double neutron stars, and they're gonna be based on one or two systems, okay? Um, and right now, even with the 50 systems, we have an uncertainty of about a factor of five in the binary black hole merger rate. The predictions before the first detection were uncertain by four or five orders of magnitude. Okay, so even with one system, we were doing pretty well. <clears throat> now, why is this the case? This is not the case for electromagnetic astronomy. And the reason is that not only we know the selection effects pretty well, but the selection effects are actually depending, depend on the mass. And what we measure is the mass. And therefore, with more and more detections, we don't just improve by square root of n but we know the luminosity function better and better, and we can control our selection effects uncertainties better and better. So this is unique to gravitational wave astronomy. It turns out that now that we have 50, the uncertainty in the rate hasn't changed that much because the square root of n is not that different, but the uncertainties in the black hole mass distribution actually haven't changed that much from 10 to 50. <clears throat> All right, now let's go to the present. Okay, now I put this plot to scare you. Uh, I'm not gonna describe it, but I'm gonna highlight the punchline. <clears throat> First of all, uh, I'm borrowing these plots from Ilya Mandel, who was a postdoc in my group when we wrote a big review on rates before the detection and his collaborator, Flor, and I cannot pronounce the last name, uh, very recent. What I want to summarize here, you'll see three of these plots. This is for binary black holes. Each color of the horizontal bars is showing you what predictions or empirical rate constraints from other analysis, non-gravitational waves, are predicting for different formation channels, isolated binary evolution, population three stars, global clusters, nuclear star clusters, okay? So you get a visual impression. That's all I need from, this, from you uh, for this slide. The vertical band is the current uncertainty on the black hole, binary black hole merger rate from gravitational wave observations only. And of course, binary black holes are only known through gravitational waves. Um, now you see that the uncertainty is a factor of 10. Earlier I told you a factor of five, and I will explain the difference when we talk about one special source, but it is really a factor of five, if, in my opinion. Uh, I'll explain why. Um, and what you see is that basically, more or less, in, first of all, in just five years, we got the uncertainty of the rate down to a factor of five. I'll come back to this. Uh, and we can form binary black hole mergers at the right rate according to models from both dynamics and isolated binary evolution. A uh, little asterisk about isolated binary evolution for later in the talk. Now, some channels are a challenge um, because basically the predictions are all over the place. And you, know, you can say that that channel explains the observations, but 
we were back to the old situation. If the predictions are five orders of magnitude uncertain, yeah, of course, they can explain the observation. Okay. So this is where we are with binary black holes. Not much of a distinguishing power for formation channels. Where are we with double neutral stars? <clears throat> well, there we have electromagnetic observations. Uh, same, um, same style, except we have neutron star, neutron star ra uh, rates, merger rates from short gamma ray bursts, if you assume they're all double neutron stars, or from kilonovi, or from galactic double neutron stars, and from theoretical studies of formation. The punchline is here. So first of all, with just a few detections, we have two. Two double neutron stars are known, okay? The multi-messenger detection that you've all heard about, and an another one. So two sources, right now the uncertainty uh, from the gravitational waves on the rate is the tightest of all the other methods, including gamma ray bursts, double neutron stars, et cetera. Um, our gravitational wave rates are consistent with what we get from radio pulsars and from other electromagnetic rate constraints, empirical. I'm not talking about models. Okay? And when we look at the models, by far, and admitted by the modelers themselves, it is practically, it seems very, very hard, if not impossible, to produce neutron star mergers at the right rate in dense stellar environments, okay? So it seems we need isolated binaries. Last, neutron star black holes. Um, a year ago, I couldn't tell you about this slide, but now we have two sources, one is high signal to noise ratio. And again, now we have the tightest constraints from gravitational waves. These are all predictions from different models and same punchline, dynamical processes have a very hard time combining a neutron star and a black hole into a pair to merge. So, I will, so this is the last you're gonna hear more or less about rates, okay? That's where we are. We can say something about formation of neutron star mergers, but not about binary black hole mergers. <clears throat> now, we're gonna focus on binary black holes, their masses and their spins. And I'm gonna start by showing you, this is the full collection of detections right now. Total mass on the x-axis, uh, and I realize now I forgot, of course, that the audience cannot see my laser pointer. So let me use the, um, the mouse. So x-axis, total mass, <clears throat> and y-axis, mass ratio. So uh, basically, on the left here are double neutron stars. Assuming, maximum, assuming the separation neutron star black hole is three solar masses. All of these here are binary black holes. The black curves are real sources, okay? Detected, confirmed, etc. cetera. Uh, and the sources here are neutron star black holes. So you can see two double neutron stars, two neutron star black holes, lots of binary black holes. Some are with color, I'll mention why. And then we have this oddball here, okay? Um, so we're gonna talk about this, but the asterisk about the binary black hole rate, if you assume that this source is a binary black hole, then the rate becomes uncertain by a factor of 10. If you say this is not a binary black hole, then the binary black hole rate is uncertain by a factor of five. Okay, here, why do we have colors? Uh, well, because these are kind of special binary black holes. And I will focus on this green one here at some point later, because it is really the most massive binary black hole we have observed, okay? And the merger product is an intermediate mass black hole. So this is the summary for masses. And now what do we do? We take the mass measurements, especially for the binary black holes, because we have a big sample, and we can do now population inference, forget models, there's no modeling here, astrophysical modeling. But we say, okay, we know selection effects, so we can correct for selection effects and we can parameterize a mass distribution. 
and um, figure out the constraints on the parameters of a mass function. So that's what we that's where we are now with for all the binary black holes. Of course, you can fit many parametric models. So uh, we fit four. Uh, they're all kind of more or less the same. The punchline is, without going through the details of all these plots, is that if you do model comparison, the, it seems like the black hole masses from these mergers are fit well by a power law of black hole mass distribution. Not surprised there for astrophysics, but there is some kind of a feature of a, or a peak uh, somewhere at around uh, 35 or 40 solar masses, okay? And uh, there's some more details here that I'm going to skip for this talk. Uh, and the question is, what is this feature? There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of hypotheses, uh, but the most sort of talked about at present and for a long while is that um, this is where we might get a pileup of black hole masses, stellar black hole masses, uh, because of um, a certain type of supernova, pair instability, uh, pulsational pair instability supernova, where basically massive stars lose a lot of their mass very late in their evolution. And because of this enormous mass loss very late in the evolution, they uh, restrict how much mass is left for that star to produce a black hole. And then you have stars more massive than 50, 60 solar masses and beyond always forming a low, ma a low mass black hole, a 40, 35 solar mass black hole, okay? So you're kind of stuck there. But then you have a tail to higher masses. We're gonna come back to that, okay? So that's the current punch punchline with masses. Uh, I, I basically, Oh yeah, I said, whatever I said is covered here. The other thing I will say for those who know something about black hole mass in more detail uh, from X-ray binaries, for many years, um, a low mass black hole gap uh, was um, claimed between uh, three and five solar masses. And it, as far as we can tell, it seems that that low mass gap is probably still there in our data as well, okay? It's tentative because we have a hard time detecting low mass black holes. So our statistics are not great. <clears throat> All right, now let's move to spin. Before I describe the plot, let me go back to the mouse. I have to uh, sort of introduce this parameter called chi effective. And because we don't measure spin, black hole spin directly, the truth is we don't measure black hole mass directly either, but we can get easily to the black hole mass. Uh, we cannot get easily to individual spins. What we measure is this mass weighted combined black hole spins projected aligned with the orbital angular momentum axis, okay? So if chi effective is zero, let's say, it could mean that both magnitudes are very, very, very small. Or it could mean that only the magnitude aligned with the orbital angular momentum is very, very, very small. And then you have a giant you know, component perpendicular or in the plane of the binary. Um, it might also mean that you have completely anti-aligned spins. So when you combine the two, if the masses are roughly equal, you get chi effective zero. So it's a complex quantity, okay? We have built a lot of intuition for that. I don't expect you to build that kind of intuition in 30 seconds of an explanation. So I'll do a little bit of guidance. <clears throat> this is our individual contour plots, 90 percentile contour plots for all the chi effective measurements. These two are the double neutron source. This is the wacky source that we don't know if it's a binary black hole or a neutron star black hole. This is a, an, an interesting binary black hole um, that has, up until before we discovered this, it had an extreme mass ratio, three to one. 
And it has an interesting spin, as we can see. This is the very massive one that gave us an intermediate mass black hole. And this we separate here, and this we separate here for two reasons. It's for different reasons. We have systems, too, that have clearly, exclusively positive chi effective, which means the spins are measurable, so not zero spins, and close to aligned with the orbital angular momentum axis. Okay. And then we have, we have no such negative source, all the whole boundary being in the negative space. And then this is the source that has the most area in the negative space. So it has a high probability of having a negative chi effective, which means it has potentially an anti-aligned spin. Why is this important? <clears throat> because, Isolated binary evolution in, in, in quick statements, isolated binary evolution is expected to give you black hole spins more or less aligned with the orbital angular momentum axis. Dense stellar clusters where the black holes were independent and they come through some dynamical process should give you an isotropic distribution of spin tilts. So if you have negative anti-aligned spins, it's a signature of dynamical formation, okay? So if we put all the selection effects together and we do uh, lots of different statistics with different models and we check and double check, this is our current punchline. The population of binary black holes with their spin measurements has a non-zero probability of containing a subpopulation with anti-aligned spins, okay? At face value, this tells you simply that, um, the, um, that there must be a contribution from dynamical formation for binary black holes. But the fact that this is well fit, this distribution function around, for the population around chi effective, corrected for selection effects, is not centered at zero also tells you that it cannot be only dynamical formation because then everything should be isotropic and then chi effective should be centered at zero. So that's sort of the, um, let's say, right now the, the conclusion one can draw, but there's many caveats. You can go in, you can do statistics, you can fit this with different models. You can put a central bin here like Matias Aldariagas and his group did. And uh, if you put a zero, a, a, a bin right at center and you make that bin very broad, then you can absorb all the statistical significance of the negative spins into the zero spin, into the zero bin. And then you find no negative chi effectives, okay? So what does this mean? It means that we don't know yet, okay? All right, we need more data. Um, but this is indicative, let's say, and worth studying more. Oh, this slide is just to show you, yeah, why is this important? Okay, in dynamical environments, you expect that the tilts will be isotropic. I think that makes sense intuitively. Uh, but in isolated binaries, um, why do you expect the spins to be aligned? This is actually uh, well known for a long, long time. Uh, the first time I met a LIGO person asked me, could you calculate spin tilts in binaries? And I said, thanks to my work with Ron, I said, yeah, but why do you care? So that was the result. Punchline is that no matter how big you make the black hole kicks, which are not big, and no matter how you manipulate various uncertainties, you cannot get black hole tilts in black hole binaries. This is a black binary black hole, forgot the label, uh, to cross beyond 90 percentile. This is a cumulative distribution, okay? And I'm just showing you a, an example plot, but this is now well accepted and confirmed by many different uh, studies. For black hole, for neutron star black holes, it's very similar. You see here two curves 
that are uh, going beyond 90 degrees with non-zero probability, but those have kicks of a thousand kilometers per second for black holes. And you know, nobody buys that. <clears throat> All right. So I summarize population constraints on binary black holes for masses and spins. One other thing we know now is that we can certainly measure merger rate evolution as a function of redshift. And now with the latest data, we can tell that actually there is an increase, marginal statistical evidence for increase as well, uh, uh, with redshift. Okay, no huge surprise, but it's good to be able to measure it. We didn't know whether we would find it flat. And of course, if we find it negative, we would be stunned, uh, negative slope. <clears throat> uh, what, what we did more recently with uh, uh, Maya Fischbeck, a name to have in mind, uh, an Einstein fellow at Sierra, um, is we actually took the merger rate as a function of redshift compared to star formation rate as a function of redshift. And uh, already now we can derive a minimum um, time delay between binary black hole formation and merger. And this minimum turns out to be about three giga years. Why is this important? Because if you look at predictions of formation models, uh, isolated binary evolution here, clusters, homogeneous chemically evolution, stellar triples, each formation channel provides qualitatively very different time delay distributions. Rates agree, mass distributions agree, spin tilts I told you about already, but the time delay distributions are very different. So if we can constrain the time delay distribution with this very straightforward empirical way, then maybe we can constrain formation paths. <clears throat> okay. How much time do I have? Okay. Um, I'd like now, so this is the population summary. I'm skipping a lot of caveats and subtleties, etc. but this is where we are big picture. And I'd like to highlight a few exceptional events. I'll talk about this very massive one and I'll give you basically more or less one slide for each one. Why are they weird and why are they of interest? Um, so the very massive one and then we'll go through a few more. Uh, the very massive one, actually before I show this plot, um, intrigued people because basically it has, and this is a plot again of total mass and mass ratio. Uh, total mass and mass ratio. The individual masses have significant statistical probability to be above that feature in the mass distribution, okay? Above the pair instability um, black hole mass limit that you might expect. And people wondered, what does this mean? Does it mean that there is no limit? Does it mean that maybe uh, the black holes of this system were already before mergers themselves, in which case you're looking, multi, you're looking at multi-generational mergers in dense clusters. Um, uh, or are they primordial black holes and it has nothing to do with stellar physics, okay? Uh, so uh, I will just, and the answer is not known. Okay, all these hypotheses could still be true. If we find many of these, maybe we can nail down the answer. Uh, but I'll just highlight here, here I am, um, that with one of my graduate students, we worked out, and believe it or not, I need to put glasses when I'm looking at my screen, but um, we analyzed the following. If, if you think all binary black holes are formed in dense clusters and you model what's going on with their mass distribution, their birth spins, mergers are happening, each merger kicks the produced black hole for reasons I'm not explaining right now, but those who know, know. Um, then can we answer the following question? What is the probability that this one source uh, is a multi-generational merger? Okay, so what we find is that 
there is a reasonable like 20% probability uh, that this one system contains two, it's a 2G, 2G. So both black holes that came together were already previous mergers. And there is an even higher probability that one of the two black holes was a previous merger. So I would say, you know, maybe it's not even an oddball, okay? But we need more sources. Another exceptional event is the second neutron star. I won't even talk about the multi-messenger source for now. Uh, I'll get to if Leslie lets me. Um, the second double neutron star is an uncomfortable system. The masses, I won't cover everything, but the masses of the two neutron stars are too high. All double neutron stars from radio pulsars in our galaxy have masses, very narrow Gaussian distribution below 1.5 solar masses, high significant, highly significant result. This double neutron star, um, even in the conservative constraint, let me use the mouse, um, with low spin assumptions, which is here, it's definitely heavy neutron star in a double neutron star. Why? And the rate we extract for this one source is actually quite comparable to the rate from the regular double neutron stars, like 17 or 817, the multi messenger source. So, why do we have a significant population of tight double neutron stars that can merge at a high enough rate according to gravitational wave data, but we don't see them as pulsars in our galaxy? What can produce that? There are many papers out there. The summary is uh, even the people who wrote the papers are not convinced their proposals are correct. This is very mysterious. Another exceptional event, this one here. Uh, let me point now since for the other, the Zoom audience. Is it a neutron star or a black hole paired with another black hole? Um, oh, I blocked. So let me, let me uh, point you here. We have a 23 solar mass black hole, roughly speaking merging with a 2.6 solar mass object and the error bar on the mass of the companion is tiny. This is very unusual for a gravitational wave measurement because usually individual masses have large error bars. Why this happens in this system, we understand very well. It has to do with the length of the uh, signal, the extreme mass ratio 10 to one, et cetera. But we can tell this is a 2.6 solar mass object. And there is no signature. This plot says there is no signature of any tidal disruption or distortion. But of course, even if it were a neutron star at 2.6 solar masses with 10 to one mass ratio, you wouldn't expect to see any tidal uh, disruption <clears throat> signature. So are we, have we discovered the heaviest neutron star or the lightest black hole. Either way, there are problems. That's all I'm going to say. If it's the heaviest neutron star, the equation of state, uh, expectations, understanding, most current constraints, which I'll get to, Leslie, um, uh, are being challenged. And then if it's the lightest black hole, how can we form a 2.6 solar mass black hole, but we don't see in X-ray binaries and in binary black holes, black holes between three and five solar mass. I'll skip this and this and this and this, all about this system. The problem with this system is not just that the secondary is bizarre, the mass ratio to form such a system 10 to one, all models are challenged, everything, isolated binary evolution, uh, dense clusters, we have not produced as a community a single model that can claim we can form this subpopulation, regardless of whether it's a neutron star or a black hole. Um, and last, mixed mergers, neutron star black holes have been detected. 
Um, the only, other than the da, we have the mixed mergers. Uh, the only weirdness there is that we also have one of them, the neutron star is a heavy neutron star. Okay. So two new neutron stars in the mixed mergers, one down there with a big tail, but you know, most of the significance is 1.25, but the other one is constrained to be above 1.5 solar mass. <clears throat> There's an interesting spin twist, but I'm running out of time. One minute, I promise. You sure? Oh, okay. All right. Maybe I don't have to rush. I want to tell you about the spin. This neutron star black hole um, not only uh, so let me say that I told you we have two neutron star black holes. One is a firm detection. The firm detection is um, uh, the firm detection. Yes, the firm detection is 115. Now I'm, I'm losing my mind. Uh, one minute, high spin, low spin. The firm detection, yes, it's the blue one. So the heavy neutron star comes from a detection that has a high probability of maybe being a noise artifact, but we can't, we're not 100% sure. But the firm detection, we have a strong constraint on the black hole spin. It's a neutron star black hole system. The black hole appears, we can put constraints on the black hole spin orientation. It's misaligned, anti-aligned. It's on the negative space. Now, remember that neutron star black holes are basically not produced in dense clusters because of the high mass ratio. You cannot bring them together in the dynamics. So how are you forming an anti-aligned system in a neutron star black hole if it came from isolated binary evolution? That's a challenge too. That challenge connects to what's going on with the spin tilts in the binary pulsar, the, the one system that both neutron stars for a short period of time were pulsars. That binary pulsar in our galaxy also has an anti-aligned spin. And obviously it's not in a cluster. <clears throat> Let me move to equation of state. <clears throat> I will not do justice to this system, to this topic. Obviously people uh, in nuclear physics, if Gordon is on Zoom, he's gonna kill me. Katerina Hadzioanu, Nico here could give a whole colloquium on this topic. I'll just tell you, you know, the, the punchline of where we are. Um, we have massive pulsars now, okay? They're not in double neutron stars. They are, we think more massive because of accretion, but we have measurements of neutron star masses that go to about 2.1 plus or minus error bars. In addition to that, we have constraints on the tidal deformability of one neutron star, a little bit more on, uh, on one versus the other in the multi-messenger source. And in addition to that, lately, we have fantastic results from NICER, uh, on mass and radius constraints from X-ray astrophysics. If you put all this together, we're now having great tight constraints on the equation of state. And uh, we can put all of this together. And um, I'll show you this plot um, that basically shows I want to concentrate on the blue line. Okay, let's, let's concentrate on the thick blue band here. If you put all the constraints together, massive pulsars, gravitational wave, one source, and the X-ray results from NICER, um, and you look at these constraints on the plane of pressure as a function of density inside the neutron star, nuclear once, 
twice, six times. Then you constrain from empirically, you constrain this plane inside the two thick blue lines. And right now, not many equations of state can stay inside that band. You can see that it gets very, very tight around um, three nuclear saturation densities. And the yellow, uh, curve I'm showing you here is an a priori, it's not a fit, okay? It's an a priori calculation of a uh, quark hadronic crossover equation of state that is uh, led by Gordon Bame and collaborators. And of course, I'm in Urbana and, you know, Gordon was a mentor and why wouldn't I show this equation of state? It's not the only one uh, who can go through there, but the others uh, have to do a, a, a much more artificial match from the low density regime to the high density regime. Okay. <clears throat> so I would say that we have strong constraints on the equation of state, but the maximum masses we have is our two point, you know, this one, for example, gives you a 2.35 solar masses. If the 2.6 solar mass object that we measure in the oddball system is a neutron star, then we're pushing again the equations of state. Okay. Now you might say, well, Vicky, clear, it's a black hole, don't worry about it, but can't resist. I ask God Ransom, can I show this? And he said, you can, there it is, slide and skip. There's one binary pulsar, 1748-2021b. Freyer claimed it to be very massive well, some time ago, here, I'm sorry, 2.9. And everybody ignored him for good reason. Okay, but now Scott Ransom's group has timing data for more than a decade. And this is their current result, all the way up to almost 2.6 solar masses, if not more, the orange curve. So they're, they're about to publish this. So I'm going to leave you with that thought in mind. <laughs> and basically, along the way, I gave you the summary of where we are, but I kept pointing out the puzzles, okay? Black hole spins, <clears throat> masses, massive neutron stars, uh, and black holes, the, the very massive black holes, neutron star equation of state, and as I said, black hole spin magnitude and tilts, and also we have the uh, merger rate as a function of redshift. So I'll stop here, thank you. So um, before I take the questions, I want to remind you that Vicky uh, will be giving a public lecture tomorrow as part of the uh, even lecture called Einstein's Waves, Cosmic Sounds from Black Holes and Neutron Stars at 7 p.m. in Lincoln Hall. And it'll be streamed too, but you don't have to wait to hold your questions till then. Uh, let's take some questions now. How do we handle questions on Zoom? Uh, can they just... We, we can open things up and you can address them. Go ahead and open up the... Give it a second. See a hand here. Okay. Hand here. Uh, thanks for the lecture. Uh, on the uh, black hole anti aligned spin, mm -hmm. uh, I think I missed it. You said that it's not possible for it to come from a cluster. Is, is that just due to rates or is there something else? Yeah, it's due to rates, uh, but the rates are too low by many orders of magnitude, according to predictions from many different groups. And, and it is well understood why the rates are so low. It has to do with how the black holes evolve in the cluster, where they find themselves deep in the gravitational potential, where the neutron stars are, and what is the probability of interaction between black holes and neutron stars. So it's not just, okay, we check three models, the rates are low. Uh, but it's well studied and well understood. And 
people don't expect that this will change. Maybe in nuclear clusters, um, but, uh, but again, in, in the classic dynamics, how dynamics work in a dense cluster, even there, you'll have the same problem. Maybe with gas and disks, something happens and we can get those. But then the rate predictions are completely up in the air. Those models are very new. So, okay, maybe they can form them in very high rates, but we'll see. Thank you. Other questions? Um, could you talk a bit more about the Poseidon project? I was curious to hear more about the status of that and uh, kind of what goes into those models. Thank you. Um, yes, so, well, um, you don't want, you gave me a, a, not a blank check right now, so that's very dangerous. Um, um, oh, you know what? The way to answer your question is this. I have a hidden slide, except it's hidden from my eyes too. Um, I'll skip. Yeah, so, um, so rapid population synthesis codes, one of which was developed 20 years in my group, Star Trek. Um, uh, basically, they, uh, they, they, at the core, they have analytical fits of what the stars do in terms of radius, luminosity, core mass, temperature, et cetera. Their analytical fits to single star models from the late 90s, okay? And there's newer and newer rapid population synthesis codes, but the core stellar astrophysics is 25 years old. Um, I won't say anything more, <laughs> okay? So, uh, the, when it, it's single stars, they try to model, and I, I include myself into that, you know, I've been using those codes for, for a decade in the 2000s. Um, you're trying to do binary evolution with single star models and not even single stars, but actually fits to single stars. And then you have mass loss and mass transfer and a, a thermally unstable mass transfer, and you're trying to figure out what the radius is doing and all of that. There's a lot of black magic in those codes, okay? Uh, so what we want to do is basically treat both the single stars before they interact here, but then every time there is an interaction between two regular stars or a compact object and a regular star, uh, means uh, hydrogen rich or helium rich, we have grids of mass transfers, mass transfer sequences, uh, using MESA, the, the public stellar evolution, stellar structure and evolution code. Now, this is not innovative. That has been done before, but usually the grids are developed for a very particular problem. What we're doing here is that um, we're developing a, a lots of grids, but then as we do Monte Carlo from the beginning, um, we're doing interpolation in the grids. And if you don't have good accuracy in your interpolation, then you're calling MESA again, you're producing new grids where you need them, new trans mass transfer sequences where you need them. You create a non-regular grid and you keep interpolating. Um, that's my, my one two minute answer. That dynamic, so your, your grid and database of mass transfer sequences is dynamically evolving as you run the code and your interpolation scheme has to do interpolation, not just initial final, but also along the track. And the shapes of the tracks are not the same throughout. So we're collaborating. This is a project that is funded um, both in Europe and uh, here at Northwestern. And we, it's a collaboration between astrophysicists and computer scientists, both in machine learning interpolation schemes and in databases. <clears throat> I have a question. On this topic, um, what are you assuming about uh, common envelope? Uh, yes, evolution? so uh, um, where was that? Was it the next slide? Uh, right now in our current version, which is not public yet, but the first version will become public and it will, it will not have all the bells and whistles I just described. 
Right now, the common envelope in the Poseidon infrastructure, um, it's the usual, you know, the thing we've always done. However, we do have a version uh, and we published the results um, with one of my students, Mo Monica Gallegos Garcia, um, where we compare, uh, you know, what's going on in binary black hole formation with and without careful modeling. There is a big difference, by the way. There, we treat the common envelope with Pablo Marchand's uh, treatment, where basically you apply a very, and it follows what Ron uh, has worked with his collaborators, um, uh, Han, et cetera, the last few years, but it, it's done online on the spot. So you remove very fast the mass of the star and you track it and you see uh, until when maybe it will detach at some point. And then, and then you say, okay, maybe that's when my common envelope finished. And you, you calculate the stellar structure of the star at every time step, okay? And it runs, it doesn't crash, <laughs> you know, for sequences and sequences and sequences. So we're gonna put this into the whole code. <laughs> Yes, we've only done massive stars, <laughs> but it works in massive stars. I think it will be easier in low mass stars, no? Yes. Yeah, okay. Any other questions in the audience? Yeah. Vicky, hi. Who is it? This is Gordon, hi. <laughs> oh, hi, Gordon, okay. Hi, hi. <laughs> um, thank you for a, a lovely talk. I. I'm very, very, very happy with everything you said. I, one, one, one question though: Is there any hope in gravitation using gravitational waves to distinguish a black hole from a neutron star? Uh, the one possibility, of course, if the neutron star, if you can, you can measure tidally formability yes. for a neutron star. But are, are there any other tricks that are possible? No, I mean the, the spin, for example, uh, tidal deformability is the one. Uh, I don't think we have any other way, assuming pure gravitational waves. And, um, and we have two double neutron stars now. As you know, in the multi-messenger source, we have some hints of, we're not really measuring tidal deformability, as you probably know very well. Uh, we have some hints of it, but strictly speaking, it's a pure upper limit um, if you put all the caveats in. The second double neutron star, we have no hint of tidal deformability because the signal to noise ratio is too low. So other than that, I don't think we have any other way. Miko? That's right, the quadruple moment. Yeah, that's right. The quadruple moment also enters into the waveform model uh, like a 2 pn order, yeah. but that's suppressed by spin squared and you know uh, would not be larger than the tidal deformability yeah. effect. I mean, so I know correct. people have looked at the magnetic field for, or I should be looking there. Uh, uh, people have looked at whether the magnetic field might do something, but it, it's, it's never dynamically important. So it, it doesn't do anything to the gravitational wave signal. Well, Vicky, I mean, of course you could get also the merger and post-merger bits if you had enough sensitivity at high frequencies. Yes, so if the post-merger bit is a, you can tell it's a hypermassive neutron star or something, then you know, that before that you had a neutron star. Yeah, somehow that doesn't, <laughs> that's not where I put my money. <laughs> but you know, eventually, I mean, with third generation detectors, that should be possible. Okay, if not, let's thank Vicky again for a great job. Thank you. <laughs>